When I was a kid, my parents sent me away to summer camp, from the time I was nine and all the way up until I was fifteen. It was a little place up in the mountains of North Carolina, far away from home and nothing like the big city I lived in. And there, my friends and I did things that I could never do in an urban environment. We trekked across the mountains for days. We cantered on horses along gorgeous trails. We climbed up waterfalls. We rappelled down into cold, dark caves. We kayaked across massive lakes and leaped off of staggering cliffs and plunged into the deep water below. And, me being a city kid, it wasn't always easy. All of that stuff involved a lot of physical struggle that I wasn't used to. Come on, what city kid knows how to climb up a waterfall? And to be honest, those heights and those leaps were terrifying to me. But no matter how scary it was, I bit the bullet and did it anyway. And throwing myself out of my comfort zone like that built character. From my struggle, from my fear, I grew. I discovered that I could do things I'd never imagined. I learned how to take risks. I learned how to carry my own. And whenever I came back home after the summer, back into my safe, cozy little urban environment, everything felt different. Almost too quiet. Too comfortable. Something in me had changed. I wasn't the person I'd been the last time I was in the city. And when I looked around, the city itself seemed to have changed, because I was looking at it with a new set of eyes. That was how I always knew that my camp experience had shaped me. That I'd grown. That I'd gone on... A journey, if you will. As I would learn later in life, it was this journey of self-discovery that Joseph Campbell calls the hero's journey, and it's the same growth through struggle that lies at the heart of his philosophy. Joseph Campbell, a comparative mythologist, studied stories and legends across countries, cultures, civilizations, and millennia, and found the single most fundamental commonality shared between them all. The Hero's Journey, or the Monomyth, as he called it in his 1949 book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. In every story ever told for all of human history, the process of the hero's journey permeates them all, a process that Campbell outlined in a series of distinct steps, and it all starts with our singular hero. The hero starts in a world that he knows, where everything is familiar and non-confrontational. He lives his life here, he carries out the banalities of his everyday existence. It may be a little mundane, but it's a place of comfort for the hero, where he doesn't have to do anything out of the ordinary. It's a state of bliss. But sooner or later, something disrupts that state of bliss. Some part of the outside world leaks into the world of the hero, and the hero is presented with something new, something he's never seen or felt before. Suddenly, the hero realizes that he's been living in a vacuum. He realizes that there's another world out there, and he's dissatisfied with the world he's living in. There's something in the outside, unknown world that the hero wants, or that he needs, and so it gives him the motivation to leave the known world and throw himself into the world of the unknown. But the world of the unknown isn't an easy place. The hero finds himself faced with a road of trials and tribulations, all part of the challenge of discovering, confronting, and overcoming the new world. But it's by his struggle along this road that the hero eventually achieves the goal he set out to accomplish. After getting a world's worth of experience under his belt, the hero finally finds that part of the unknown world he was looking for. This is the emotional, spiritual, and developmental height of his journey, what Campbell calls atonement and apotheosis. And, with all the experience and wisdom he's gained from his journey, he returns back to his home, back to the known world, having experienced both sides of the known-unknown divide and coming out a stronger person for it. The story of a hero stepping outside his own front door and embarking on a journey to attain a goal is a tale as old as civilization itself, dating all the way back to ancient Sumeria. King Gilgamesh, an arrogant, despotic ruler, is scared of dying, so he ventures out into the wilderness with his friend Enkidu to find the flower of immortality and returns back to his kingdom with eternal life. Though, granted, of another sort than the one he set out to find. Odysseus wants to come home to Ithaca, so he sets out upon the sea, encountering monsters and terrors along the way until he finally sees his wife and son again. And it's a tale that has persisted to this very day. 
Frodo Baggins gets called on by Gandalf to destroy the One Ring, so he leaves the Shire, treks across Middle-earth, throws the ring into Mount Doom, and goes home. Luke Skywalker's bored with his life on the farm, so he goes with Obi-Wan Kenobi to learn the ways of the Jedi, faces adversity from Darth Vader, and eventually overcomes the dark side of the Force to destroy the Empire. It's easy to draw a direct link between Campbell's formula and these kinds of stories, to see it as a kind of algorithm that most stories follow, but that's not the complete picture. That's not what the hero's journey is really about. Sure, the hero's journey can be a literal journey, like those of Gilgamesh or Odysseus or Frodo Baggins, but the journey ultimately is an internal one. Gilgamesh never actually gets the flower of immortality. Instead, along the way, he learns the value of love and friendship, and that he will be truly immortal if he leaves behind a legacy of being a good king loved by his subjects. It's this wisdom that leads Gilgamesh to be a kind and just ruler, and to treat his subjects well. Odysseus sets out upon the sea to go back home, but if not for all the shit he had to face along the way, he wouldn't have appreciated how wonderful it was to return to his family. The literal journey is only an extended metaphor, an externalization of the character's internal states. I think one of the best examples of this is the story of Harry Potter, which, despite its lighthearted tone in its earlier installments, is all about death. Yes, Harry leaves the Dursleys because it sucks and the world of magic is so much cooler, but why is it so much cooler? Why does his life at the Dursleys suck? Well, because they're abusive, sure, but what makes Harry the saddest of all is the fact that he has no parents. When Harry learns that he's a wizard and that his parents were wizards, he accepts Hagrid's call to discover the wizarding world because it's a chance for him to connect to his parents and their world, to discover a life that might have been. It's why defending Hogwarts from evil for all those years is so important. Because Hogwarts is Harry's home, his true home, the only connection he has to that life. It's why he connects so quickly to people like Dumbledore, Lupin, and Sirius. First, because through them, he learns more about his parents, what they were like, what kind of lives they led. And second, because they act as parental figures to Harry, the kinds of figures that Harry lost and that the Dursleys could never provide. And sure, Harry faces off against Voldemort and comes way too close to dying on a pretty frequent basis. But Voldemort isn't just some guy who doesn't like Harry Potter. He's the guy who killed Harry's parents, and the struggle against Voldemort is the externalization of Harry's larger internal struggle of grappling with his parents' death. And when he learns that death is not something to be feared, he finally comes to terms with this trauma. It's a revelation so beautifully symbolized by Harry finally standing and speaking with the specters of his parents, where before they were separated and silent. Harry is coming to terms, literal speaking terms, with death, the barrier that has separated him from his family his entire life. And this is when he is finally able to defeat Voldemort, bringing the conflict to a full, resolute close. You can view Harry's journey as a call to defeat the most dangerous wizard of all time, but what makes the story matter to us is what happens underneath. So while it's intuitive to see the final showdown in the courtyard as the climax of the series, we really find it in that moment in the forest, when Harry is finally, for just a few minutes, reunited with the family he's searched for this whole time. And if you need any more proof that the real journey of Harry Potter is Harry finding his family, there's a reason the series ends with Harry starting a family of his own. Now I promise I'll be getting to my main argument in just a minute, but there's one last thing I need to explain for it to hold together. The point I wanted to make with the Harry Potter example is that the hero's journey is ultimately a personal one. But now I want to boil it down even further, and examine how the journey can be so personal that it happens entirely inside the mind. We see this in the story of the Buddha. I assume you all know the story, how Prince Siddhartha leaves the comfort of his palace and views the outside world for the first time, but his journey really begins when he sees the three men suffering in the streets, something he's never seen before. His call to embark on the journey is the question, why exists suffering? And the journey itself is Prince Siddhartha's meditations, his struggle to understand. He sits under the Bodhi tree and he thinks, and thinks, and thinks. He considers different paths of life, different extremes of the human spectrum, they all end in suffering. He continuously tries and fails to understand why such a thing exists, until finally, after tireless mental strain, he achieves enlightenment. The wisdom he gains from the journey is truth, 
the answer to his question. And that's what the hero's journey is really about, if you ask me. It's about the struggle to gain knowledge. It's a process that we go through every day. You want to learn to play the guitar? You're going to have to actually play the guitar, make mistakes, learn from them, and practice for years and years. You're not going to be the next Hendrix because you decided you wanted to be. You want to be more physically fit? You're going to have to strain your body and work out and build up your muscles day by day. They're not going to suddenly bulk up if you simply will them to. You want to know everything there is to know about organic chemistry? The knowledge isn't going to just pop into your head, you've got to bury your head in a textbook for a real long time. Hell, it's the foundation of the scientific method. If you have a question about the natural universe, you have to develop a hypothesis and experiment to find the answer. To accomplish any kind of goal, to attain any kind of truth, you've got to struggle to get there. Even if you're a natural at it and it comes easily to you, you've got to put forth the effort to actually learn the thing you want to learn. It's not going to come to you if you sit on your ass all day and don't change anything. If you don't go through that struggle, then what is there on the other side for you to appreciate? If you've never wanted anything in your life, then what have you gained? And if you've never learned anything because you didn't expose yourself to new things, then how have you grown as a person? The hero's journey isn't a formula for telling stories. It's the underlying truth that makes those stories important because it's a microcosm of the human experience. It's why it persists across temporal, geographic, and cultural boundaries, because it's the one thing that we all share. It's how we learn and grow. Indeed, many consider the hero's journey to be a metaphor for life itself. You strive endlessly to find some kind of meaning or wisdom in life. You continuously look for purpose, and you may never find it. But don't you grow every time you get a little closer? It's a bit cliche at this point, but I think the adage rings especially true here. It's not about the destination, it's about the journey. It's this idea that lies at the heart of existentialist philosophy as well. That you, the individual, bear the responsibility of finding your own meaning and purpose in life, and that you have to struggle to find it. There is nothing innate in you that makes you who you are. You have to define yourself through your actions. And most importantly, no one is going to just give you your purpose, least of all God. It's why I don't find religion all that attractive. Because the question of meaning is a hard one, and I don't believe that hard questions have easy answers. To me, religion is like a mental shelter from existential struggle. You don't have to figure out your life's meaning through years of contemplation and personal growth. God's already given your life its purpose and value, and we can end the discussion there. It's an attempt to shortcut the hero's journey by never having to face any kind of adversity. And what I see from the social justice movement with their so-called safe spaces is just the same thing. By shutting yourself off from viewpoints that challenge you, by excluding individuals whose very existence you find threatening, by hiding away from ideas that make you uncomfortable or disgusted or scared or, God forbid, triggered, you deprive yourself of quite possibly the most fundamental human experience there is. You don't even shortcut the hero's journey, you deny it altogether. You willingly keep yourself in the comfortable world of the known. You refuse the call to adventure. What? No, 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 wait. We do not want any adventures here. Thank you, not today. No. And by keeping yourself in a position of intellectual and emotional stasis, you deny yourself the kind of personal growth that has defined humanity since the dawn of civilization. Most of the objections I hear leveled against safe spaces are accusations of authoritarian intellectual tyranny. That they censor differing opinions, that they segregate people based on arbitrary characteristics. And I agree with those objections, but there's some part of me that senses that they come from a place of anger. When I hear about safe spaces, I might get angry at first, but then I get bummed out. I don't hate the easily triggered. I pity them. I feel sorry for them. It makes me sad that they don't want to broaden their horizons, that they don't want to engage with ideas that challenge them or make them uncomfortable. They want to shut themselves off from anything unpleasant, from the struggle that causes us to grow as human beings. Even if you don't derive some higher wisdom from some run-of-the-mill inconvenience that makes you uncomfortable, facing it head-on will at least teach you how to deal with it in the future. It's a very simple concept that I had assumed most people learn as a child. The reason things are unpleasant is because we don't know how to deal with them. 
when you learn how to deal with them, they become not unpleasant. That's the hero's journey in action again. And really, isn't the social justice movement just one big intellectual safe space? It's an ideology in which disagreement is equivalent to heresy, in which you can't even entertain ideas that challenge your own. It's an existence in which perpetual victimhood is treated as a virtue, thus never giving an incentive for change or growth. It's a movement in which innate characteristics like your race, gender, and sexuality are what define you as a person, not the way your personal journey has shaped you. It flies in the face of Campbell, of existentialism. It flies in the face of life. There's a big difference between being happy and not being unhappy. Just look at Huxley's portrait of the future in Brave New World. In Huxley's worldview, people want to be not unhappy, rather than truly happy. Being not unhappy means you haven't engaged in any kind of struggle, you haven't experienced any unpleasantness, but it's not true happiness. True happiness is what lies at the other end of the struggle and unpleasantness. Without the struggle, you can't appreciate what's on the other side, and you can't be truly happy. In a society where people desire comfort and complacency above all else, no one's ever going to develop into stronger, wiser, happier human beings. Can you imagine what a static, sterile world that would be? Where we're never challenged by other people, or by art, or philosophy, or anything? Can you imagine a world where the only ideas we're able to consume are the familiar and the non-confrontational? A world of constant pandering to our most infantile, intellectually lazy sensibilities? I worry that's the world we're going to be looking at very soon. So here's to confrontation, to discomfort, to fear, to unpleasantness. I think they'll all be better for us in the end.